Good evening, Limerick. It's a pleasure to be here, even if only virtually, once again. So this is the end of everything. As you can see from the subtitle, I'm talking about the fate of the Earth, the Sun, the galaxy, and ultimately the universe. So I'm going to give a little bit of a prologue and then look at the future of the Earth and the solar system, look a little further into the future and the future of stars and galaxies, and eventually, by the end of the talk, we'll have looked into the far, 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 far future and the ultimate fate of the universe. And if that gets far too depressing, I will finish with a little bit of an epilogue, somewhat more upbeat. So let me just give a little bit of a prologue. In a different talk, I talk about how the universe began, the beginning of everything. And not surprisingly, this talk, the end of everything, is the bookend to that. So in the beginning of everything, I describe how the universe expanded from a very small volume up to the size we see today. So at the moment, the observable universe is a sphere with a diameter of some 100 billion light years or so. And inside there, we see trillions of galaxies. But as the universe is expanding, we deduce that everything used to be a lot closer together. And those trillions of galaxies spread over 100 billion light years used to be separated by no more than centimetres, the size of a golf ball. And in the early universe, protons and neutrons were made, which ultimately became the hydrogen and helium that we see in the universe today. So in this talk, I'm talking about the future, not the past 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang, but what's going to happen from now onwards. And I'm using this timeline, this future timeline with the numbers across the top here. Can I just ask, would it be possible to mute the microphone at your end just to avoid any more noises? Yeah, no worries. OK, that's wonderful. So we're looking at this timeline across the top here, and these numbers represent not years into the future, but 10 to the power how many years into the future. Each small box, in other words, represents 10 times further into the future. So I'll be looking at, for instance, 10 to the power 3, 1,000 years into the future, 10 to the 4, 5, 6, a million years into the future, 7, 8, 9, a billion years into the future. You get the sort of idea a trillion years into the future. And this red box is going to move across the top of the screen. That will help us keep track of exactly where we are, because of course there's going to be some very large numbers thrown at you uh, in the next uh, hour or so. I'm indebted to the work of Adams and Laughlin, who published about, what is it, 25 years ago now. They published a paper in which they indicated the timescales on which many astrophysical phenomena are predicted to occur. And I've used that paper to try and get my slides in strict chronological order. So sometimes I'll be talking about the Earth, sometimes the Sun, sometimes the galaxy, but in all cases, I'll just go in chronological order rather than topic order. So let's start with not the next few years. Let's jump ahead a few thousand years because let's assume that we get climate change under control, let's assume we don't blow ourselves up. We can say with some certainty that in 10 to the 4 years or so, 10,000 years into the future, we know how the Earth's axis is going to change. The Earth's axis is processing, and so the, the direction of the Earth's axis is sweeping out this large circle in the sky, and we know it does that every 26,000 years or so. And if we plot out that circle on the sky, we see that at the moment the Earth's axis is pointing towards Polaris. And in another 10,000 years or so, the Earth's axis is going to be pointing in the other direction, very close to the bright star Vega. So pointing out the pole star will become a lot easier in 10,000 years. Boy Scouts are going to love this because when they're asked to find north, it'll be very much easier than it is now. But what are the consequences of the pole star changing? Well, at the moment, on the left-hand side here, we can see that we are nearer to the Sun, perihelion, because of the elliptical orbit of the Earth. We're actually closest to the Sun in January during northern winter. But if the axis of the Earth changes, as shown on the right, we are going to be nearer to the Sun during northern summer. 
that means the seasons are going to be exaggerated because when we're in summer we're going to be closer to the sun which is just going to exaggerate the temperature differences between summer and winter. And these variations in the Earth's climate due to changes either in the Earth's spin or the Earth's orbit around the Sun, collectively they're called Milankovitch cycles. I'll mention that one more time in a few slides time. If we move to 10 to the 5 years into the future, we see that voyagers are going to be passing nearby stars. So the Voyager probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, launched in the late 1970s, Voyager 1 going past Jupiter and Saturn, Voyager 2 going past Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and uh, Neptune, they're heading out of the solar system in different directions. So at the top left there we see Voyager 1, that's heading off in the direction of Gliese 445, a star system that it will pass in somewhere between 10 and 100,000 years, perhaps 30 to 40,000 years it should pass through that star system. Voyager 2 at the bottom of the picture there, that's heading off in a different direction, and it will pass through the star system Ross 248 on a similar sort of timescale. Now Pioneers 10 and 11 were actually launched earlier in the early 70s rather than the late 70s, but they are not travelling quite as fast, so they'll take a little bit longer to reach any nearby stars. Pioneer 10 on the right is heading off in the direction of Aldebaran. Pioneer 11 on the left is heading off in the direction of the centre of the galaxy. On a time scale of 10 to the 5 years, 100,000 years into the future, well, we know from the historical record that the Earth has been through cycles of ice ages, gl glacial and interglacial periods that tend to come and go on timescales of order 100,000 years or so. And we know from the historical record built into the uh, sediments of the Earth that the Earth entered an interglacial period relatively recently. And so we reckon that the next ice age is due on a time scale of order 100,000 years or so. What causes these ice ages? Well, again, it's another manifestation of so-called Milankovitch cycles. This one is due to changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun. If you want to know more about that, then after the talk you can go away and Google Milankovitch cycles and find out more about how these work. Still on a timescale of 100,000 years into the future, the Earth will continue to slow down, as it has been doing, as far as we can tell, for billions of years. So in a separate talk I talk about how the rotation of the Earth is slowing, and if we want to keep our clocks synchronised with the rotation of the Earth, then we have to keep adjusting our clocks by adding a leap second every once in a while. We've added a leap second perhaps every few years for the last few decades. But in 100,000 years time, the Earth will have slowed down to the point where we would need to add leap seconds not once every few years, but we would need to add a leap second every day. In other words, the rotation period of the Earth would not be 24 hours, it would actually be 24 hours and one second. Probably the last minute of the day would have to be 61 seconds long rather than 60 seconds long to keep our clocks synchronised with the Earth. On a similar time scale, we can't be too sure, but we think on a time scale of order 100,000 years, we would expect one of the stars in our Milky Way to be a spectacular supernova. It might be Eta Carinae, as indicated in this picture. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture of the nebula produced by this particular star being so unstable that the outer atmosphere of the star is being shrugged off into interstellar space, forming a planetary nebula. And we think this is a precursor to the fact that it won't be long before this particular star goes supernova. It might be beaten by Antares, it might be beaten by Betelgeuse in terms of which goes off first, but we think on this time scale we will have had another supernova within our galaxy. But supernovas aren't the only things we need to watch out for. For instance, Wolf Ray A104 is a star which is about 7,000 light years away, and it sounds like, well, surely whatever happens to that star, it's so distant from us it can't cause us any cause for concern. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Its death may result in a radiation burst even more powerful than a supernova. 
And that's because it's a rapidly rotating system which has produced jets via a mechanism that we don't fully understand, but it's being researched. And if these jets happen to be pointing in our direction when the star dies, it's thought that there will be a very intense burst of gamma radiation along the direction of these jets. If that jet happens to be pointing at Earth, we could receive a significant radiation dose, even at this distance of 7,000 light years. It's been calculated that if we were really unlucky, the gamma ray burst that might result in when this star dies could, in principle, evaporate our biosphere and kill life on Earth. But we would have to be rather unlucky for the jet to point exactly in our direction. Moving forward to one million years into the future. We know that stars are going around the Milky Way and some of those can be mapped very accurately. For instance, the Gaia spacecraft has been monitoring and measuring the positions of stars and their velocities. And from that, we can deduce how the Sun is moving around the Milky Way and how other stars are moving. And because we're all in independent orbits, every once in a while we may get close to some of our neighbours and then drift away again. It's been calculated that one star called Gliese 710 is going to pass quite close to us and then drift away again. And it's be going to become close enough that it will actually be inside our Oort cloud. The Oort cloud, a large sphere of trillions of icy bodies, some of which are responsible for comets raining down into the inner solar system. When Gliese 710 enters the Oort cloud, it's almost certainly going to produce huge disruptions to that spherical cloud, which are gravitationally bound by our sun. If you bring a second sun into the mix, then it's going to disturb their orbits. And it's been thought that this is going to result in huge numbers of comets raining down into the inner solar system. Perhaps bright naked eye comets every few weeks for a million years. It's going to be quite spectacular. But one thing to note is that for a little while, our solar system will have two suns, just like other places that you may have heard of. Also on a time scale of a million years, you may think this picture of Meteor Crater, Arizona, might be indicating that we can expect an impact like this every million years or so. Well, that's not really why the picture is there. For one, we can think to ourselves, wow, wasn't it lucky that this asteroid just missed the visitor's centre on the edge there? Wow, what a stroke of luck, eh? But really, this is there not to show that we expect an impact like this every million years, but to remind us that there are lots of impacts like this on the Earth, but they become eroded because of weathering. And on timescales of order a million years, we would expect a large impact crater to be lost completely. So in other words, we've only got a record of impact craters that have arrived relatively recently. Any very old impact craters will have been lost through weathering. And you might think, well, OK, that's obviously going to happen on Earth, but it clearly doesn't happen anywhere else like on the moon because we know the footprints of Aldrin and Armstrong are going to last forever. Well, strictly not true. Even the footprint of Aldrin is going to end up getting eroded, not because of weathering in the sense we understand on Earth, but by bombardment with micrometeorites is going to effectively stir up the regolith and rearrange the regolith to the point where we no longer recognise, for instance, footprints or tracks of the lunar rover. Indeed, it's been calculated that in the far distant future, all evidence of the Apollo landings will be erased. In other words, the lunar module, the lunar rover, all the equipment eventually will com be completely eradicated through the impact of micrometeorites if you take a long enough time frame. Moving to 10 million years into the future, we can think about the fate of Pioneer 10. We know it's going to pass through various solar systems on timescales of order 10 to the 4 years or so. So after 10 to the 7 years, it will have probably passed through maybe hundreds, if not thousands, of solar systems. Maybe, if any of those solar systems harbour life, somebody somewhere will pick up Pioneer 10. And they, be, they may be interested to read the plaque which is on the side, which tells them 
where the plaque, uh, sorry, where the spacecraft came from, because this picture on the left is a pulsar map saying that if you can recognize these pulsars, then that's where we came from. And the spacecraft itself came from the third rock from the sun. So people can backtrack using this plaque to tell the origin of Pioneer 10. Except that on timescales of 10 to the 7 years, we would expect this plaque to become pitted and eroded to the point where it might no longer be readable. And that's simply because Pioneer 10 is flying through interstellar space. And although we think of space as empty, it isn't. Interstellar space is full of tiny grains of dust. And at the speed Pioneer 10 is traveling, as this spacecraft is plowing through the interstellar medium, it will become pitted and eroded and this plaque will no longer be readable. So if it gets picked up after it's been through perhaps a thousand solar systems, then the people who pick it up will not necessarily be able to tell its origin. Moving to 10 to the 8 years, we can ask ourselves what's happening with Saturn's rings. But perhaps it first makes sense to think about how Saturn's rings came into existence in the first place. One theory is that the moon, Mimas, might have made Saturn's rings. In other words, is it possible that a moon about the size of Mimas somehow got pulverised and the debris formed the Saturn ring system? When we look at a moon like that, we might think to ourselves... That's no moon. It's a space station. Because it does bear a, quite a resemblance to the Death Star. But a simulation has been carried out by saying, well, let's take something about the size of Mimas or Mimas and let's pulverize it and then see what happens to the cloud of debris. You might expect that the cloud of debris simply orbits Saturn in much the same way that the Moon did. But actually what happens is perhaps a bit of a surprise. The debris soon gets stretched out into the orbit. Notice the timescale in the bottom right. It only takes a matter of days or weeks to form what is recognisable as a ring system. And it might have happened many millions of years ago, but the ring system will have formed quite quickly. And what's hap been happening since then is all of the ring particles are interacting with each other and that that interaction is causing them to spiral inwards towards the surface of Saturn. So the ring system is not a stable structure. So over millions of years, we end up with a ring system that we recognize today with each individual particle slowly spiraling in and eventually raining down onto the surface of Saturn. And as far as we can tell, that process is continuing. So if we look at the clock going forward many millions of years, let's just take arbitrarily 100 million years into the future, then we can expect all of the particles in the ring system to have continued to spiral in and have rained down on the surface of Saturn. And so the ring system will effectively have disappeared. So all of you who like looking at Saturn through a large telescope, like a large aperture Dobsonian, for instance, well, make sure you get that viewing in soon because you won't have the opportunity in about 10 to the 8 years or so. Similarly, on a timescale of 10 to the 8 years, it's easy to fool ourselves into thinking that the solar system is going to behave itself and the planets are going to go around the sun, as would be indicated by an orrery, or the moon is going to go around the earth and the earth's going to go around the sun, as indicated by this tellurian on the right. Whenever we see clockwork models like this, regardless if they're wind up or motorized, we can fool ourselves into thinking that we'll know exactly where the planets are going to be in the future. But we should remind ourselves that actually the solar system is chaotic. Yes, we can work out where Jupiter is now and how fast Jupiter is traveling, and hence we can work out where Jupiter is going to be in decades, in centuries, in thousands of years into the future. Or if we wish, we can dial the clock backwards and work out where Jupiter and Venus were in the sky 2,000 years ago and ask ourselves, is it possible that that was the Star of Bethlehem? 
So thousands of years, that's an easy calculation. The solar system is, if you like, clockwork. But on a time scale of 10 to the 8 years, the solar system is chaotic. We don't even know whether we'll have the same planets in the solar system on this time scale, let alone know exactly where they are. It might be that Jupiter ends up throwing some of the other planets out of the solar system. We think, for instance, the early solar system looked very different to the solar system we see today, and it will almost certainly be different in the future. Still on a time scale of 10 to the 8 years into the future. That's roughly how long it takes the Milky Way to rotate once. At the moment, the Sun is here, as indicated by the yellow dot. Roughly speaking, halfway between two spiral arms in a relatively low density part of the Milky Way. Well, as the Milky Way rotates, we think that the Sun is going to end up moving into one of those spiral arms. From doing simulations and modelling of how the spiral arms behave, we think we are going to end up in a region which is of much higher density. In other words, we will have more stellar neighbours than we do now. What is the consequence of having many more stellar neighbours? Well, we've already seen one in the sense of when Gliese 710 makes a close approach, it will disrupt the Oort cloud and send lots of asteroids and comets sent our way. And we think that will happen more and more, especially if we have lots of stellar neighbours. And if we look at the record in Earth's crust, we find that when we look at how many animal species existed as a function of time, we see extinctions, these spikes that seem to occur, well, a few times over a period of a few hundred million years. Present is on the right and the far past is on the left. So species have been extinguished on timescales of order a hundred million years or so. The last one on the right hand side there, the so-called KT boundary, is the boundary between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary eras. That's the one that killed the dinosaurs. So there was a, a major event which we assume is an asteroid collision. There's evidence of an asteroid collision on Earth. And we think that one is the one that effectively killed the dinosaurs. And it's thought that these come round every few hundred million years because the, the, uh, the Sun, and hence the Earth, ends up going into a dense region of the Milky Way. Lots of stellar neighbours, lots of disruption to all of the asteroids and comets which then rain down into the inner solar system, some of which will collide with the Earth. So here's a sort of artist's impression, that's of course all it is, of what it might look like when one of these large rocks comes hurtling towards the Earth. On the left hand side there you see Italy and it looks like it's bad news for Italy. Well, yes, but when we're talking about a really large rock, it doesn't really matter where you are on Earth. A large rock hitting the Earth is going to be bad news for the entire planet, not just a local region of where it hits. Species will be exterminated. Whether that will include us, well, that's a big unknown. We know that supernova are going to be a problem. Remember, we are talking about a period in which we're going to have more neighbours. Well, at the moment, we don't necessarily have a problem with nearby supernova because none of the stars that are close to us are supernova candidates. But when we move into a spiral arm of the Milky Way and we have many more neighbours, then there's a chance that one of those neighbours might be a supernova candidate. If a supernova goes off within 100 light years of Earth, that would be a danger to Earth. And we reckon that if we have a supernova going off, excuse me, within 20 light years of Earth, then it could, in principle, the radiation from such a supernova at such a close distance, the radiation could, in principle, sterilise the planet. And we know this has happened. It's not entirely hypothetical, because when we look at supernova that have gone off not so far from us, we do have in some evidence from the Earth's record. Supernova within about 100 light years of us will leave a deposit in the Earth's sediments, the deposit of a particular isotope called iron-60. It's not a natural isotope of iron, it's one that is only generated in very energetic explosions like supernova. 
and iron 60 will hang around for quite a few million years but eventually that iron isotope will change into something else it'll change into cobalt and then into nickel that means that if we look in the earth sediments and we find some iron 60 isotope given that we know it changes after some millions of years if we find any then it must have arrived here relatively recently it can't have been sitting around since the formation of the Earth itself, because that was billions of years ago, and any iron 60 that existed at that time would long ago have decayed into cobalt and then nickel. So the fact that we see this particular isotope on, in the Earth's crust tells us that we must have had supernova not so far away in the Earth's past within the last billion years or so. So it has happened in the past, it will happen in the future. We can't say exactly how many supernova will go off close to us, but it's something we'll have to keep an eye on. Still on a time scale of 10 to the 8 years into the future, the distance to the moon will start to increase because all of this time the moon has been slowing the Earth down. The Earth's rate of spin is slowing because the moon is robbing the Earth of some of its angular momentum. The spin of the Earth is, is going down, but the angular momentum of the moon is increasing. And as a result, the moon is getting further away from the Earth. We can measure that now. We can measure the distance to the moon increasing a few centimetres every year. But by the time we get to 10 to the 8 years into the future, the length of the day will now have increased from 24 hours to 25 hours. Maybe this is a good point at which we throw away the 24 hour clock and start to, I don't know, decimalize into a hundred quarter hours or something like that. But as well as that, the distance from the Earth to the Moon will have increased to the point where the Moon is so far away from the Earth that it will no longer be possible to have a total eclipse of the Sun. By the time we get to of order a billion years into the future, the distance from the Earth to the Moon will be so large that the disk of the Moon will no longer be large enough in our skies to cover the disk of the Sun. So it will still be possible to have partial eclipses and annular eclipses, but we will never again get a total eclipse of the Sun. So again, for those of you who like eclipse chasing, get your bookings in because after a billion years it will no longer be possible. There's a second problem with the moon getting further away from the earth. It's not just that we lose the spectacle of an eclipse. There's a rather important reason that we want to keep the moon close to us. The moon has a stabilizing influence on the tilt of the earth. Historical records tell us that the tilt of the Earth can't have changed by much more than about one degree either side of its current value of 23 and a half degrees. If we look at the cartoon on the left, you can see roughly what that means, a tiny variation in the tilt of the Earth backwards and forwards over long time periods, but it hasn't ever changed by much. And given that the tilt of the Earth determines the seasons, that means the seasons have been relatively stable for billions of years. But if the Moon moves further away from the Earth, it doesn't have the same stabilizing influence on the Earth's tilt. And that means the Earth's tilt could suddenly change erratically. Instead of 23 and a half degrees, it could change to zero or 60 degrees or 90 degrees. And as a result, there could be erratic changes in the Earth's climate. So regardless of what we try and do to keep climate change under control, we are in for a rough time in the future because we know that there will be dramatic changes to the Earth's climate in the far distant future. Still on 10 to the 9 years in the future, we can think about what's happening to Voyager. We know it's passed through solar systems at the rate of one solar system every few tens of thousands of years. So clearly after a billion years, it will have had the opportunity to pass through thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of different solar systems. On board is the so-called gold disk. It's actually a copper disk coated in gold. On the right you can see it's effectively a phonograph in which have been encoded sounds and images from Earth. It's been calculated that that gold disc ought to survive for about 
a billion years. Remember, the Pioneer plaque might only last for 10 to the 7 years because it will get pitted and eroded by passage through the interstellar medium. So how come the Voyager discs, disc, uh, one on each of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, how come the Voyager discs will last a hundred times longer? Well, that's because the disc on the right is sitting underneath a protective cover on the left. So that means the disc will last for longer, giving more opportunity for civilizations in different solar systems to pick up the Voyager probe and read the disc. The problem is, although the disc is indeed protected by the cover on the left, which will get pitted and eroded, it's the cover on the left that contains the instructions for reading the disc on the right. So unfortunately, there is a problem. After a billion years or so, even if Voyager 1 or 2 get picked up by civilizations, they will not be able to read the instructions for how to read the disc. Maybe they'll be intelligent enough to figure it out for themselves. Who knows? On timescales of order billion years or so, the Sun is not quite yet a red giant. That will happen on a timescale between 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 10 years. But after a billion years or so, the Sun is going to start increasing in luminosity as it travels on its journey towards being a red giant. Its luminosity might increase by maybe 10% in every billion years. And that means the Earth is going to get distinctly warm. The surface temperature of the Earth might rise to a relatively balmy 80 Celsius or so. So the oceans are going to be evaporating and we're going to have to ask ourselves, what do we want to do? Even going underground may not be an option. We have to ask ourselves, are we going to leave the Earth and come back when it's cooled off a little bit? The sun will become a red giant in a few billion years and the red giant phase is such that the sun will swell and its radius will increase and the surface of the sun will start moving towards the earth. And yes, it looks like, well, that could be a problem for us. But it's not actually certain that the earth will be engulfed by the sun. It's often been calculated, it's often been quoted, that when the sun expands to become a red giant, its radius will be comparable to the radius of the earth's orbit. That does seem like that's very likely. But one other thing you have to bear in mind is that as the sun expands, there will be a very strong solar wind and the sun will lose a lot of mass from a strong solar wind from the surface. If the Sun loses mass, then there's less gravity pulling on the Earth, which means the orbit of the Earth will expand in size. The Earth will move away from the Sun. So the cartoon on the left shows what might happen. As the Sun expands, the Earth will move away from the Sun. So at some point, the Sun will engulf and become larger than the Earth's original orbit, but the Earth isn't there anymore. The Earth could have moved out until it's in a different position, perhaps somewhere near where Mars is now. People have calculated the possibility of this happening and there's other factors which need to be taken into account. And it's not really obvious whether the Earth will be engulfed or not when the Sun goes through its red giant phase. The Earth might survive. Let's assume it does for the time being. When the Sun has been through its red giant phase, it will slough off its outer layers and produce a planetary nebula, and the core of the Sun will remain as what we call a white dwarf, effectively a lump of principally carbon. Maybe that carbon will be under high enough pressure to actually form diamond, we don't really know. But that's not the end of the story for Earth. Now that the Sun is a lot smaller, you can ask what's going to happen to the Earth, well, one of the things that's going to happen to the Earth on this time scale of many billions of years into the future is that the Earth's core is going to cool and as a result it'll lose its magnetic field. The Earth's core is not being kept warm by the Sun. The Earth's core is being kept warm by the radioactive decay of elements that have been sitting there for billions of years. But eventually that radioactive decay will not be enough to keep the core of the Earth molten. 
the core of the Earth will solidify, will no longer have a liquid dynamo to make a magnetic field, and once we lose the magnetic field, we'll be susceptible to radiation, perhaps not so much from the Sun, but certainly from the rest of the cosmos. It's thought that maybe this is what's happened to Mars um, a long time ago. Mars is smaller than the Earth, so it would have cooled faster, and if the liquid core of Mars, which originally produced a magnetic field, if that solidified a long time ago, then Mars would have lost its magnetic field a long time ago, and perhaps that's why it's lost its atmosphere. So the Earth maybe will survive the Sun going through a red giant phase, and maybe the Earth will survive losing its magnetic field. They say bad luck always comes in threes. What else could possibly be in store for the Earth? Well, on the same time scale, we're looking at a collision between the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way. So we know at the moment the Andromeda galaxy is about two and a half million light years away, but on a time scale of a few billion years, it will be continuing to move towards us, and we think we'll get a collision of the two galaxies on a time scale of order three or four or five billion years. When that happens, there's going to be a riot of star formation, new star formation, as the two galaxies pass through each other. Almost certainly what will happen is very few stars will actually collide, perhaps even none. The gas of one and the gas of the other will collide, and the dust of one and the dust of the other will collide, and there'll be strong tidal effects. But the galaxies will pass through each other and then eventually settle down into one large galaxy. So as seen from Earth, assuming Earth survives, we won't see a spiral galaxy anymore, we won't see Andromeda in our skies, we'll see a large, probably elliptical galaxy. In this particular image here, we have two nuclei because the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way and the supermassive black hole at the centre of Andromeda have not yet merged. It appears we still have two separate nuclei, um, two separate uh, supermassive black holes in these brightest regions. Given long enough, these two will end up orbiting each other and eventually coalesce into one huge black hole. But that's not necessarily bad news for Earth. It sounds cataclysmic, but it isn't necessarily. If the Sun survives, if the Sun, even if the Sun gets pulled out of the Milky Way by the passage of Andromeda, by the tidal effects of these two galaxies coming close together. Even if the Sun is removed from the Milky Way, it'll take millions of years for that to happen, and the planets will simply go with it. Whatever planets still exist at that time will simply move with the Sun. It's not like the Sun will get torn away and the Earth will get left behind. So maybe the collision with Andromeda is not such bad news after all. By the time we get to 10 to the power 11 years into the future, 100 billion years into the future, the little dance between the Earth and the Moon comes to its conclusion. Now we find that one day is equal to one month. In other words, the length of time it takes the Earth to rotate once on its axis, one day, is the same as the length of time it takes the Moon to go around the Earth, one month. So in other words, the Moon has been slowing down the Earth to, um, until the two are synchronised. And now we have the situation that the Earth is tidally locked to the Moon. One side of the Earth always faces the Moon, which is mirroring, of course, what has been happening with the Moon for ages. One side of the Moon has always been facing the Earth for billions of years. And at this point in the future, the same will be true of the Earth. In other words, it'll be possible assuming mankind still exists, to stand on one continent and the moon will always be at the same point in the sky. It'll never set and it'll never rise. And also there will be some points on the earth on the other side of this particular image where you would never see the moon rise in your sky. This, by the way, looks like a Photoshop picture, but it is a genuine image of the earth and the moon as taken by the Deep Space Climate Observatory. So from this point on, the Earth and the Moon will simply rotate each, round each other, always facing each other in much the same way that Pluto and Charon do at the moment. You see the red box is now all the way on the right. We're now talking about 10 to the 12, 1 trillion years into the future. 
all of the objects in the local group of galaxies are going to merge together. If we have a look at the Milky Way in the centre there, the Milky Way is surrounded by lots of rather small satellite galaxies. Small galaxies like uh, the Large and Small Magellanic Cloud, for instance, and dozens, if not hundreds, of smaller galaxies. So we know that the Milky Way is going to uh, end up colliding with Andromeda, but eventually the Milky Way and Andromeda and M33 and all of the ob other objects as shown here in the local group, they are all going to merge together into one mega galaxy. It won't actually be a spiral galaxy, that's just a symbolic representation there in the image. So if all of the galaxies end up as one, because essentially galaxies are cannibals, so they will eat each other and the largest galaxy usually wins and the smaller ones lose, if that's what's happening in a local scale, what's happening to other galaxies in the universe? Well, in a separate talk, I talk about ancient light in which you can image very distant galaxies. Even those galaxies that are so far away from us, the expansion of the universe is carrying those galaxies away from us at twice the speed of light. Even so, those galaxies can be imaged. I've done that myself from my back garden. On the right hand side we see a Hubble ultra deep field and most of the galaxies in this image again are receding from us faster than the speed of light because of the expansion of the universe. Some of the closer ones might be going a little more slowly but the very distant ones are certainly receding from us if very fast. If we go 10 to the 12 years into the future the expansion of the universe, assuming it continues in the way it seems to be doing at the moment, if the expansion of the universe continues, then the galaxies, after a trillion years or so, are going to be so far apart from each other that it will be impossible to image any of them. And it's sobering to think that if a civilization comes along in a trillion years' time and build themselves a Hubble Space Telescope and point it into the universe, to see what's out there, what they will see is essentially nothing other than the stars that are in their own galaxy. Just like we would take this image and those are two stars in the Milky Way, everything else in the image was more distant galaxies. If a civilization tries the same thing, it doesn't matter how good their telescope is, after a trillion years they will not see anything beyond their own galaxy. So if they're interested in finding out what the universe is made of and how much is out there, they will come to the wrong conclusion. They will come to the conclusion that the entire universe is only their galaxy, because that's all they will be able to observe, regardless of how good their technology is. It's a sobering thought. I said that in the very early universe, 13.8 billion years ago, it took about three minutes to make everything that is since then being rearranged a little bit. In other words, it took three minutes to make all of the hydrogen in the universe. And since then, for the last 13.8 billion years, those atoms of hydrogen, the protons and the neutrons, have simply been rearranged to make helium and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and calcium and phosphorus and us basically. It took three minutes to make all the hydrogen, but it's being used every year to make new stars. After a trillion years, the hydrogen is starting to run out. It's been hypothesized that, well, okay, maybe, just maybe, it's possible to make stars out of something other than hydrogen. People have hypothesized that, well, maybe it's possible to actually make stars out of heavier elements. And people have done calculations that indicate it might be possible to have a star in which nuclear, mm, nuclear reactions are occurring at the core, even though the surface temperatures are very low. Remember, the surface temperature of a red giant might be about 3000 Kelvin or so. Perhaps it's possible to make stars 10 times cooler than that. Perhaps it's possible to have a surface temperature as low as a few hundred Kelvin rather than a few thousand Kelvin. 
and it's been hypothesized that maybe you can actually have stars with nuclear reactions at the core, but ice in the atmosphere. Frozen stars. Um, okay, there's the Disney version of frozen stars. That's not what I'm talking about. If that's the picture that you've got in your head, then let it go. Because what I'm talking about is nuclear reactions in the core and ice in the atmosphere. That's only a hypothesis. There's no proof that these things will actually exist. A lot of people seem to think that you can only really get star formation started with the lightest of elements, hydrogen. You can't start arbitrarily with heavier elements. Before we go any further, and no, I'm not quite done yet, but in order that this talk is not going to last until midnight, I'm going to change the, uh, the, the gear slightly. Each box in the timeline at the top now is not 10 times further into the future. It's now a million times further into the future than the previous box. So... We said that the universe is running out of hydrogen. OK, stars might live for trillions of years, but they don't live forever. So if the hydrogen is running out, what does that mean? There will come a time when there are no more stars shining. The age of starlight will come to an end. The stars, the dead stars, the cores of stars will continue to orbit around their galaxies. White dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes. None of these stars are undergoing thermonuclear fusion to generate energy to allow them to shine. White dwarfs only appear white to start with because they're hot, not because there are any nuclear reactions keeping them hot. So in other words, they will simply cool down given enough time and they will become black dwarfs. The picture on the right you can probably hardly make out, even if I make it brighter. A black dwarf is basically just a lump of carbon. Whether it's graphite, whether it's carbon, whether it's diamond, it doesn't matter. It's just a large sphere of mainly carbon. Some stars will be ejected from the galaxies and the remainder will be eaten by the central supermassive black hole, SMBH here. Now, the mechanism by which that happens, we've got a little bit of understanding because the magnetic fields in a distant galaxy called NGC 1097 have actually been mapped out by an infrared telescope called SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. There's an infrared telescope in the back of a 747 and it flies at high altitude to get above most of the atmosphere that would otherwise absorb the infrared. Unfortunately, the 747 is now effectively decommissioned. But the, one of the observations made by this observatory is these magnetic field lines that you can see on the left. And it's thought that matter flows down these magnetic field lines and effectively gets funneled into the supermassive black hole, which we can't see in this particular image, right at the centre of the galaxy. And we think that's the ultimate fate of any matter left in the galaxy. It will end up getting swallowed by the black hole. Now we know that atoms, like the picture shown on the right here, electrons are held in the atoms by the positive charge at the center. Negatively charged electrons are held in place by the positively charged nucleus. And it's protons that are responsible for that positive charge. But if protons decay, that means all atoms will fall apart. Every atom in the universe will fall apart if protons don't survive as protons until the end of time. And we don't know whether that will happen or not. If protons do decay, they're not going to decay on a time scale of less than 
the red box 10 to the 36 years. If it was any faster than that, we would have seen it happen already. So it's either extremely slow or it will never happen. Let us for the time being assume that protons don't decay so that atoms survive a while longer. But they won't survive forever because even if protons don't decay, then black dwarfs, which are basically the only source of atoms now, they will eventually evaporate, leaving no atoms in the universe. Remember, the other stars are neutron stars, which aren't made of atoms, they're made of neutrons, and black holes. And who knows what's inside a black hole, but it's unlikely to be atoms. So eventually, on this time scale, 10 to the 42 years, it's been calculated that there will be no atoms left in the universe. Whatever black holes still exist will end up merging with each other and swallowing up all the neutron stars. Any galaxies that still exist will coalesce, they will merge together, and the supermassive black holes at the cores of those galaxies will end up merging. So those supermassive black holes won't be millions of solar masses or even billions of solar masses. It's thought that these monsters will grow to perhaps trillions of solar masses. But even black holes are not eternal. They will evaporate, providing you wait for a really, really, really long time. So why do black holes evaporate? Let's just take a very quick aside into quantum mechanics. The theory of quantum mechanics says that you can make particles and antiparticles that have been borrowed from, well, essentially borrowed from nothing. You're allowed to borrow energy and make particles and antiparticles as long as they annihilate and pay back the borrowed energy on a very short time scale. In other words, borrow energy, make some stuff, and then they annihilate and pay back the loan again. How does that help us understand black holes? Well, Stephen Hawking started to ponder what would happen if this process occurred just outside the event horizon of a black hole. What happens if we borrow some energy, make some stuff, whoa, one of them falls into the black hole, but the other one doesn't. They now can't annihilate to pay back the loan. It looks like the black hole has ejected something. It's not come from inside the black hole, it's come from just outside the event horizon. But it looks like there's a flux of particles of something, it's actually radiation rather than matter at the end of the day, but this flux of radiation is what we now call Hawking radiation, who first um, posited the idea of this could happen. The radiation increases with, in, with decreasing mass. In other words, as the objects get smaller, they radiate even faster. So what that means is black holes evaporate, and as they get smaller, they evaporate faster. They radiate more, which makes them smaller. And if they're smaller, they irradiate even faster, which makes them even smaller, until they finally disappear in a flash of radiation. And on the longest timescales, even the most massive black holes, which will radiate very slowly at first, the supermassive black holes that lurk at the centres of most galaxies, even they eventually will evaporate on timescales which are many trillions of times longer than the timescales for stellar mass black holes. So we've come to the end of our timeline. Let's just say, let's go with 10 to the power 100 as being the biggest number that we can think of. 10 to the power 100 is a Google. Not, not that Google. That Google is just a misspelling of the actual Google on the left there. 10 to the power 100, after a Google years, the last black hole should have evaporated and there will be no matter left anywhere in the universe. Everything will be converted simply to radiation. And that radiation, as the universe expands, the radiation wavelength will simply get longer and longer and longer and longer. But there will be no stuff anywhere, just radiation. We think of time passing by thinking of the motion of something relative to something else. But if there's no matter in the universe anymore, then the concept of time becomes essentially meaningless. So this isn't the end of time as such, 
but you ask yourself, what's the point of thinking about what's going on beyond 10 to the power 100 years? And I don't usually do this, but let's just remind ourselves how silly that number is by actually writing it out in full. There is 10 to the power 100. 10,000 million, 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 etc., etc., etc. A ridiculously long time. It's difficult enough to get your head around what a trillion years means, let alone a number like that. So how do we start thinking about these ridiculously long times? Well, some people add a little bit of humour. Woody Allen said eternity is a very long time, especially towards the end. But if you're trying to put a human perspective on it, I like the attitude of XKCD cartoons. They said a human is a system for converting dust billions of years ago into dust billions of years from now via a roundabout process, which involves checking email a lot. I can relate to that quite definitely. So if that's got you thoroughly depressed, everything is going to come to an end. Let me try finishing with an epilogue, which is a little more upbeat. We live in a golden age. The sun is middle-aged and well-behaved. The moon is at the right distance to stabilise the Earth's axis and hence stabilise the Earth's seasons. And as a byproduct, it also gives us the spectacle of a total solar eclipse. Thanks to evolution, we are able to explore and discover and understand the universe, either by building spacecraft which can visit our closest neighbours, or by building ourselves telescopes with which we can look out into the universe and see trillions of galaxies at distances of billions of light years. But we could not have existed in the very early universe. Humankind could not have arisen in the early universe because we needed generations of stars to make the heavy elements. We needed stars to convert hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and calcium and phosphorus and iron in order to make us, us. And as we've just seen, trillions of years from now, the universe will be dark and boring. So you could say the best time to exist is now. Thank you for listening.